start with public comments. Do we have any today? We do. We have them on the um, 809 below. Okay. We'll wait till we get to that uh, agenda item. That will move us on to items to be placed on the regular city commission agenda, which is our minutes from our June 15th regular meeting. Commissioners, did you have a chance to look at that? And if you if you did, did you can we move that on to our agenda? Thank you. Uh, move us on to items for presentation and discussion. Item one is an update on the bike across Kansas event uh, here in town with John Cullen. Come on up, John. Good afternoon. Well, Commission, Mr. Mayor, appreciate the opportunity to kind of give you an update of the recent activity in the community. I come bearing gifts, so uh, you can pass those around and take one if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, last, uh, let's see, June 17th, Friday afternoon, that was uh, a little over a week ago now, um, uh, back across Kansas came into Ottawa and we hosted 800 guests that evening in our hotels uh, and camping, some stayed with friends. Uh, but most of them, the majority, stayed out of the Ottawa High School and uh, slept on the gymnasium floors. The tents were pitched actually between the soccer and football fields uh, out on uh, OHS property, uh, USD 290. And uh, it was a, a big event. They actually started rolling into town about uh, 10 o'clock that morning, uh, which meant they, meant they made it from Opie in pretty good time. And uh, I think everyone that I visited with personally says that the hill just outside of Ottawa coming in was just about killed them all. <laughs> they hadn't seen the one heading out though. <laughs> And uh, one person says, well, you know, I've learned one thing. Uh, she wasn't from uh, Kansas. She said, I always had the impression that Kansas is flat, and I know now that it's not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the uh, list of the paper that I passed out was uh, the different events that uh, are downtown and uh, retailers and restaurateurs uh, provided. Uh, for all the uh, bikers when they came in town, we passed these out, and uh, that was from help with the uh, City of Ottawa and Franklin County both, and uh, they all greatly appreciated that. I saw a lot of those that evening at the Travis Marvin concert. Uh, that afternoon, uh, we had good reports from uh, especially our restaurants, uh, having talked with about five of them, and including three downtown, uh, not Lost Brewery, uh, uh, well, Luigi, so actually mm -hmm. four Luigi's, uh, Pizza Time, and El Sol uh, all just had booming crowds. Uh, Not Lost reported it was their best day since they've opened business over a couple years ago. So uh, it turned out to be very good uh, and profitable for uh, our downtown retailers. So we really appreciate that. And we did have live music that day. It was about 98 that afternoon. And so we closed down the street, but not many people took advantage of the games or sitting around in lawn chairs, but uh, not lost, uh, separately provided an outdoor beer garden and they had shade for it. And so some people did sit outside and protect, uh, watch everything going on. That was from two to five. And then at uh, uh, six that evening, we moved the party over to Legacy Square. We had four different food trucks there big crowd that evening. Uh, we had some great local sponsors that allowed us to be able to provide that uh, opportunity. So we just think it was a big event and uh, we appreciate the partnership we had with the City of Ottawa, uh, not only your staff and administration, uh, but also OPD, uh, you know, uh, played a big important role. And uh, so really it was a uh, ORC uh, helped sponsor and provide different things. Uh, it, it couldn't have been more of a community effort uh, than what we provided uh, that afternoon. And uh, we had a lot of reports from participants that uh, Ottawa uh, was the uh, most congenial and best organized community that they stayed in. So we felt good about those reports. Uh, they're all anecdotal, nothing official, but uh, we really uh, enjoyed the support we had from the community, from uh, the BAK participants. Uh, that Saturday morning, my wife and uh, several other teachers and students served breakfast to about 400 of the participants. I'm still eating leftover egg casserole. <laughs> uh, we were, uh, she was able to take uh, uh, egg casserole with several others. Uh, 
that uh, have had uh, some uh, life tragedies, uh, most of which you probably know. And uh, so uh, we were able to do that with uh, some of the cash rolls too. So anyway, all that uh, being said, it was a uh, uh, good event and well received in the uh, community and well received by Bike Across Kansas. We hope they come again. Uh, it's been 11 years since they've been here previously, and so and 10 years before that. So it's not something that happens often. Uh, but if we show them a good time when they're here, that's liable to induce them to come back. And uh, it certainly is profitable for the people in in town. Uh, we hope that uh, other retailers experience good experiences. They all, uh, most downtown businesses offered some sort of a deal. But of course, these weren't really shoppers, but we know we had a lot of browsers, and so hopefully some of them are enticed to come back to the community at some point in time. Uh, so with that said, I'll ask if anybody has any questions about the day or the event, or had any comments you wanted to share. Are there many bikers that were expecting uh, Well, uh, they uh, had uh, 630 bike participants, and but uh, they traveled with, I mean, people started rolling in in cars uh, before the bikers did that, that morning. Uh, they were support team, uh, you know, uh, I met a, a guy from Cedarvale, who that's where my daughter's from, and amazingly enough, but he was a grandfather, and he was pulling a trailer with a uh, year for his son and grandson who were on the trip. Uh, so uh, people were all over Kansas, and they weren't necessarily riding in it, but uh, that's how come I say 800, because many traveled with a support team that drove a camper or something, and they stayed in that. So it, it was a, uh, a a big group in town for one night. It's a big it's a big event to host 800 guests for one night. <laughs> I, said, I talked to several of them, and this was all their first one, too, to come to Canada. Yeah. So that's always kind of encouraging to hear that as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, be sure to come. We want to invite you. Make sure you know about our next event, which is August 12th in Legacy Square. Uh, Sir, I believe uh, Commissioner Taylor, you know the bass player in that. In that, in that. <laughs> and so it's another band with local connections. Chad Kaler is the uh, guitarist in that band. So we're looking forward to them. Sons of Sterling is the name, and it'll be on the evening of August 12th. So hope to see you down there on that night. Thank you, thank John. You. you bet. John, thank, thank you. Everybody. You bet. Oh. That'll move us on to item two, which is our continued discussion of the 2021 audited financial statement. I believe Sean Gordon is on Zoom. Yes, that's correct. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so I presented the 2021 audit report um, last um, meeting. So um, I, I can go through that that again if you would like me to or if anybody has any questions um, now that you've been able to review the report uh, just go ahead and let me know. Commissioners do you have any other questions for Sean uh, after his presentation from last week and now that we've had another week to review? Sean I guess best way to describe it maybe just some cosmetic changes or, or amendments to what we've been doing and nothing major? Yes that's that's correct yeah. That's the best kind of report, I always say. So. Yes, yeah, and 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 I'll I'll say again that the overall auditor's opinion was an unmodified opinion. So it it just shows um, that that the city's financial department and its its overall audit is is meeting and exceeding expectations. Um, so they're doing a good job of meeting internal control um, guidelines and recommendations, and and financial statements are presented very very well. Commissioners, any other questions for Sean? Okay. Director Landis, did you have something to add to this? Yeah. Thank you. Just um, real quick, I wanted to add that, you know, often, and, and Sean does a great job of thanking us for our participation and coordination of the audit and doing all of that. But always, and especially this year, we had to get feedback and we we used staff across the city and department heads and not just the finance staff to um go through review all the funds verify everything that was going on close the funds that we no longer needed 
um, some of them being grant funds, just things that need to be done. And so I just want to make sure that you all know, I know a lot of times you don't see the behind the scenes work, but to let you know that, that really everyone across the city did a really good job. Um, there's some key people in each department that really do a great job of managing their own grants and their own funds and their projects. And um, so the finance department especially appreciates them um, always being able to answer our questions and provide the work that they did. And, it's not, and sometimes that's in a scramble to try and get those, you know, what we needed to be able to answer questions for our auditors and, and keep everything moving in the right direction. So anyway, I just want to share with you our appreciation and, and let you know that they're really working hard on this, these things too. And this is your first audit too, right? Since you've been here? Um, no, we did. Mm -hmm. We, I was here at the tail end. Yeah. <clears throat> was I here at the tail end last year? The very end, the very, very end, actually, everybody yeah. else did the this work last year. I just showed up for the presentation, I think. <laughs> got, all, got all the credit. <laughs> Great job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, anyway, that's all I really wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sunday, are there any other questions for either Director Landis or Sean? If not, this is our second time discussing this. Um, typically, you know, we, we discuss it twice just to see if there's anything that comes up in the meantime. Um, I don't believe I have any other questions. Uh, how would you like to proceed on this item? Just do the meeting and move forward. Mm -hmm. yes, Put it on July 6th agenda? Yep. Yep. Okay, that's what we'll do. Sean, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I'll move us on to item three, which is our continued discussion of a conditional use permit request for construction of a duplex at 809 South Willow in an R1 low density residential district. Director Hall, good afternoon. Good afternoon. This will be up in a minute. So this is a request for a conditional use permit for a duplex in an R1 single family residential district. Um, as you recall, staff recommended to the Planning Commission approval. The Planning Commission voted 4 1 to, rec to afford a recommendation in, to you to not approve. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to what was presented at the last meeting. Uh, I will say that uh, it's been confirmed that we received protest petitions sufficient to require a three quarter vote three-quarter majority vote in order to approve the conditional use permit. Um, the applicant for the conditional use permit is here. He has some photos, photos he wants to present to you of, area, of uh, just the character of the, of the general area. Um, so some of the concerns that were expressed in the previous meetings, including at the public hearing, is that a duplex is out of character with the neighborhood, uh, that there could be a detrimental effect on stormwater drainage, and there were concerns also about traffic and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't have anything else uh, in, in particular to share with you. Uh, if you have any questions of me, I'd be happy to take questions. Mike, what is the um, trigger for a protest petition and what is the distance that the protest petition covers. So the way the protest petition works is uh, there's a notice required of the public hearing uh, to notify all owners of property within, within 200 feet of the subject property. And uh, the way the protest petition works, it, it's confusing that it's called a protest petition because really what it is, is a, um, a protest against you um, approving the conditional use permit in this case, or in the case of a rezone amending the zoning map. Uh, the way a protest uh, qualifies to require the three quarters vote is that 20% uh, of the property within the notice area, not including public streets, is represented by uh, the petitioners. And so it's not a number of the owners, it's the amount of property. And so we had to do a calculation. There's a map uh, that I provided. Actually, I, I think it was given to you a map that shows that this is a, what they call a valid pro a protest um, requiring a different vote. So in essence, it's a trigger petition. 
Yeah, it's a, a tre tre is there's a, a super vote by the elected officials. Correct. There's a threshold. So this passes the threshold. Mm -hmm. So some of the names on here are not eligible for the last 200 pages. Is that correct? Or is that uh, what, what this represents, this represents all of the folks that were notified. Okay. All the property owners were notified. And the highlighted are the people that protested. Okay. One of these protesters, I believe, is right outside the notification area, or mostly outside the notification area. Okay. And the ones not in yellow? No, no, they didn't protest. They were notified of the hearing. They received a notice, okay. but they did not file a protest. Uh, the protest uh, deadline has passed. It's 14 days after the date of the public hearing. <clears throat> Commissioners, any other questions for Director Hall? Okay, we'll uh, we'll take the first public comment, which would be who's our first public comment? Uh, Nancy. Okay, Nancy, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Nancy Lady, and I live in 808 South Willow. Uh, it's the third week our neighborhood has received you know, notices to, or has chosen to appear at this meeting. Um, this past week, our neighborhood has received a lot of attention from all of you. Uh, most have at least driven through. Some have stopped and investigated some of the issues. We thank you for that. Um, I know that some of you even identified a traffic hazard that hadn't been mentioned before and immediately took care of it. Um, you also have a new understanding of the challenge to getting to that power pole. The city also cleaned the state a storm drains, which may help the street keep from flooding as often. So we thank you for that. I feel this process is kind of backwards. The developer's permit was recommended to be denied, yet we've heard almost nothing from him other than there's a duplex already in the area a block away. A duplex that looks nothing like what he has planned and does indeed blend with the neighborhood. Yet we come in here each week and defend our neighborhood, the character of our neighborhood, the fact that we are single family homes. Um, it did occur to me that we all look at this, different, this neighborhood differently. Um, the developer sees an empty lot and the opportunity to make some money. The officials drive through and you see that some of the houses need some attention. And also there's an empty lot. But you also see they're all single family homes. You know, you've seen the dots on the map and think maybe there should be more people in this, you know, this area because, you know, there aren't a lot of people on our block right now. Now, the actual residents see people. We see the single family homes. We see the young families. We see the single people. We see the renters who have been here for many years. We see the family whose children have grown up here and may be leaving to start their own lives. We see the people who have raised their children and now are left alone. We see the people who are here because they want to be, not just because it was available. We see homes that may not be kept as well as they once were, but that's how life is. You know, as people get older, they may not be able to perform the tasks they could before. Vital neighborhoods revitalize themselves in their own time. <clears throat> the old move on, the new come in. That's just how it is. The density of neighborhoods should ebb and flow with time because there again, the old aren't there, the new are coming in. You're getting maybe more families, as you are, the people who are there are also getting older. Uh, the advantage of a single family home is obvious. You know, the owner is vested in the neighborhood. You know, they care about what's happening, what else is being proposed there. Um, 
a renter a new flat is likely just passing through. Most of them are very short term. Um, I know we rented a new flat for a while when we got here with the intent of staying no more than in the duplex for no more than a year, maybe two. Well, you know, we found the home we wanted. We want a neighbor, not just an occupant. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Who's the next public comment? Clark Ray. Come on up, Clark. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, since our last meeting, I've given a lot more thought about what was said. Um, I think Director Hall uh, touched on all the issues that most of us have mentioned, um, so there's no need to talk about those again. He also brought up the, I guess, the benchmark and the, the threshold for triggering, um, I guess, a higher voting standard, so to speak, and the community has met that that standard and issued the protest petitions required to meet that standard. So I'm not going to reiterate any of that. Um, with all of it said, you know, I don't envy the position you guys are in right now or on the day that you guys vote. Uh, while each of you have your own experiences, such as Mr. Skidmore mentioned last time of living beside a duplex and that being a positive experience, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that his experience is the same as the residents in our neighborhood. Uh, to us, there's a reason that we don't want a duplex there. Uh, we can argue fact or opinion about stormwater, property value, speculate and argue about parking or traffic or the number of people that may or may not live there. Uh, however, if you've gotten out and driven the other neighborhoods where the builders duplexes have been built, they are very distinctly different than the historically aged homes on Willow Street. To everyone there, a duplex is much out of character for numerous reasons. Um, <clears throat> another fact that can't be argued is this. The residents are passionately opposed to a duplex being built for some reason that is important to them. And whatever that reason is, they are allowed to have a voice in influencing the decision-making process. So in the very near future, you guys, have to make the decision on whether the builder wanting to pop up another cookie cutter duplex carries more weight with the city than the residents within the community that will be affected. These residents have followed the established process of opposition and has demonstrated an, an overwhelming outcry opposing the project. Now the city has to demonstrate to the public watching these meetings and the community that has opposed the project that they will take the voice of the many and let it carry weight it deserves over the voice of one builder, a builder that lives outside the city and outside the community that we refer to as home. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do we have another public comment? We do. Yeah. Yep. Right. Come on up. Hope everybody's having a good day. Thank you, you too. My name is Liam Ryan. I moved into 803 South Willow Street when I was six years old. This year, I, start, I started my own unique business to Ottawa. I opened, I opened Raven Creek Roastery uh, for local coffee sales. I was raised in a home with core family values and a love for my community, which I chose, uh, which is why I chose to stay in Ottawa and open Raven Creek Roastery. I'm the next generation, and I do not want to duplex as a neighbor. My childhood neighborhood will not be improved, nor will Ottawa with a duplex in our community. I have deeply invested in my community and these amazing people who continue to support one another. Please recognize our position and trust the neighbors. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Reagan? Come on up, Reagan. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Reagan Ryan. I moved into 803 South Willows before my first birthday. Like my brother, I too am deeply rooted to Ottawa. I am the first female pilot to come from aviation from Ottawa's Aviation Explorers post 8000. Last year, I visited Amelia Earhart's birth home. Significance that that home, her family and community had upon her 
upon her career was not lost among my thoughts as I walked the halls and rooms she once had. I have a duty to continue to give to my community that has given so much to my flying career. I am also bound to speak out when I see my beloved neighbors that have so adamantly spoken about life change to my childhood neighborhood. I am no Amelia, but in this supportive community, I could be. This duplex does not support the people of our community. Please be moved to vote against a duplex next to the home that has stoked a passion for flying and a love of family and community. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Louise Ryan. Hello, hello, once hello. again. First and foremost, what a weekend for our city. Uh, I would imagine the mental and emotional exhaustion has been rather taxing on you all. Uh, peace, light, and love to the first responders and their family. What a tough weight to carry. I would like to thank the city for the due diligence to address some of our neighborhood concerns. It was not unnoticed and very much appreciated, so thank you. While I understand one of you may not be turned off by having a duplex as a neighbor, and I can respect your viewpoint, However, your shoes do not fit my feet today, tomorrow, or will they fit 10 years from now? I do not know how to state it more clearly or plainly. The neighbors do not want a duplex on the 800 block of South Willow. While one of you stated, I hate to turn down a permit just because. If I may ask, what about the many constituents that have been crystal clear our dissatisfaction if this is approved. That should cause significant pause. And I say to you, are we not valued? The Planning Commission overwhelmingly agreed that this build is not in the best interest of the 800 block of South Willow. It remains my greatest hope you will view it through the same lens and reject the duplex project. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Last advocate, come on. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, can I this? Yeah. Okay, I do have some picture. Just wanted to um, just to pass out. Um, I just pass it around. This this is just of all the the houses on the 700 and 800 block of South Willow. Just so you get an idea of the, the neighborhood we're talking about. Um, I don't have that much to say, but I do have a couple things to add from uh, from our last meeting. Um, to, in reference to the parking spots, um, the way the sidewalk is situated from the street, there's actually room for there's one more parking spot there because there's 22 foot between the backside of the curb and the sidewalk. You need 19. So I'll actually have one there and then two, you know, one more in the driveway, one more in the garage on each unit. So actually there'll be three parking cells already per per unit. Um, <clears throat> another thing I want to point out the side of the lot, I mean it's a very large lot, a lot larger larger than most, you know, buildable lots in Ottawa. Um, the other three conditional use permits that we got in the last couple of years, all those were less than 11,000 square feet. This one's um, just a little shy of 14,500. So significantly larger than all the other ones. It's uh, plenty large for this structure. Um, something else was mentioned last meeting was, you know, and I don't know if it was directed at necessarily me or, you know, what would, you know, my son and I would be, who would be running out to his mission, 12 college kids or something in a duplex. Um, all the ones I own, the most I've ever rented out to is two adults per side. Um, so um, just info. Um, and, you know, um, I, it seems like, I mean, I feel like, you know, the city wants new houses. You know, they want new construction, but 
you know, it's just human nature. I feel like usually when it's next door, it's not as much desired. You know, they want it for, for you know, for sure for the city, but maybe just not in my backyard. Um, Cause I'll run into that with just, just a, you know, just a regular house and vacant lot, uh, you know, they just, you know, they kind of like the vacant lot next to them, you know, um, but, you know, uh, the city needs housing and, um, you know, we think this would be actually fit just fine in the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, I think that's all I have. If you guys, unless you guys have any questions. I've got a question. I, the ones that you built on the con, I believe. Yeah. Have you visited the neighbors after construction? Are they satisfied? What's their impression or any other comments by them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when I'm, because I'm on site a lot building these, so a lot of times I'll get to know the neighbors just, just you know, just being there. Um, and yeah, the ones on Pecan, I mean, um, got to know the one neighbor real well. Um, they didn't have any problem with it, you know. Uh, and on the other one of Pecan, uh, I think, you know, I think initially, like at the public hearing, I, I think the one guy that uh, they're referring to that, you know, actually became friends with during the process of, you know, building and getting to know him, talking to him, I think he was one of the, you know, one of the ones that, you know, protested or commented or whatever, didn't want it. That's just typical. Um, and now they're on the one on the 700 block of a con, you know, there's one or two that, that you know, come in public hearing, they didn't, you know, they want to duplex. Um, and, you know, so you got to know her fine. I mean, we didn't, you know, visit her a lot, but she was, you know, very friendly and fine. Didn't seem to have any problem, you know. Um, so, yeah, I haven't had any issue with any of the neighbors on Pecan. Um, and, you know, don't know why I would. I mean, this isn't, you know, like I said before, this isn't like a some cheap thing you just throw up and walk away from and you don't keep an eye on. I mean, this is a lot of investment. You, you know, um, we do care that it's taken care of. We do care about the neighborhood. Because um, it's, um, you know, I think it's beneficial for the neighborhood. Not a detriment, personally. Mr. Any other questions for Mr. Van Venner? I have, I have a couple. Tell me approximately how many houses or duplexes have you built in our community? Um, yeah, the duplexes. Let's see, or single family attached, as I like mm -hmm. to call them. Um, I guess three. Mm -hmm. The third one's almost done, not quite, starting the fourth. Um, houses, probably mid-30s, probably. So, uh, yeah. And um, do you, will this be your first rental, if this good moves forward? No, no. Um, I have one that I bought uh, that's kind of set like these. I mean, single family attached. Um, and I've built two that are rented out. Uh, so I have three of these that are rented out. I mean, the third one's not the not I bought it. It doesn't look like this. Mm -hmm. um, and my son's actually finishing his first one that he's going to live in half and rent the other half out. You mentioned that the three cars parked on each. Right. They could be. I guess that'd be in tandem, I suppose, how that would be, right? Right, and right. I don't know how practical that is if somebody in the garage wants to get out and there's two parts behind them. Is there is that one? That right. There's two? not like a, you know, uh, uh, yeah, backup spot or whatever. So, I mean, yeah, you, if, you know, in that situation, you would have to move cars. Of course, a lot of people, honestly, I mean, it's, it is, there's parking for three cars. I don't, I mean, a lot of people don't use their garage for their car. Yeah. You know, just to be honest, it's, yeah. you know, stuff right. um but um but still it has you know parking for three but yeah and the parking is approved on that side of the street right now yes that's another thing like i if it's a parking issue i have no problem with making a little no parking i mean if that's the problem address the problem you know and th th there won't be any worry about 
who was living there parking on the street because you know they'll get a ticket or whatever if they yeah. do um i'm not concerned with you know yeah. do whatever is best for willow street you know um Mr. Virginia, any other questions for Mr. Vandeveen? Has there ever been consideration of building what I would consider a single family home on that lot? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, has there ever been consideration of building what I would no. consider a single family home? No, that lot was purchased. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, you know, it's a totally fair question. I'm not, I'm just trying to be frank, not trying to be mm -hmm. rude, but um, it, it was purchased with the specific intent of building this, it, it wouldn't have been for the pride, honestly, just for price purchase. It, that would it never would have been bought for some family. Right. And you know, this wasn't just a shot in the dark. Like, man, I wonder if I could get a kitchen or use permit for this. I don't know. Um, I mean, I can show you my other conditional use permits that have been approved. So it's like the ones I've gotten approved on Pecan, the one on Wilson. I, I mean, like I said, I mean, I had no. Uh, you know, no concerns. You know, I thought it was would be slam dunk. You know, just based on past. You know, in the past year, on the past twenty years, or just the past year, two years, and the other the other three have been approved. So, any other questions? Have you had any conversations with? I see it's owned by a trust, the neighbor directly to the south. I saw that they did not petition against eight fifteen. Okay, um, so it's owned by a trust. So I'm assuming either whoever lives there would be a part of the trust, or it might be a rental. I think I know who you're talking about. Um, you're talking about the property directly south. Directly south. Directly south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked to him. I, I'm actually I'm friends with him. I know him. I, so I called him after I saw the video of the planning commission meeting. We had a good conversation. Um, and, um, you know, so I don't, uh, what was your question? Is that just that? Oh, just I, being spoken if he's, since whoever owns that property was not at least on the petition against. Okay. Being, yeah. Being immediately adjacent. Right. Just, right. Right. I, my understanding, he owns, I mean, he owns a lot of rental property and several right there in that neighborhood. Um, but yeah, I mean. I guess you'd have to ask him why he didn't. But what I'm just saying, we I know him. We have known him for a long time. I we talked. I talked to him and had a good conversation. Um, I don't know that changed his mind. I mean, I don't think I changed his mind really. Um, but um, yeah. And this this new fix this happens is different. What's that? Where is this one? Located? That's one at the corner of Seventh and Willow. Seventh and Willow. On the you know south side of. Seventh okay. east side of Willow. Okay. All right. So just about a block, block. directly north. Okay. Is this the duplex we've been talking about? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Okay. Now, well, well, that's already there. That's right. right. Yeah. But there's another one that looks about two, three houses directly north of this open lot, isn't there? Is I, don't the so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I thought. It was like that. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions for Mr. Brandon? Thank you, sir. Right, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I got a couple of questions for Mr. Finch, if he'd like to come up and answer some questions, please. Good afternoon. Hello. If you could just kind of explain, I guess, our process here. Um, I'm assuming you're familiar with what the Planning Commission went through with a public hearing and then how we would could possibly move forward or what our options are moving forward. Sure. So it's important to kind of start at the beginning and remember that uh, conditional use permits, special use permits are treated like uh, requests to amend the zoning ordinance. So just like if you were going from R1 to an R2 or a C1 to a C2, and the Planning Commission um, acts as a quasi-judicial body. They conduct a public hearing. They're issued findings, recommended findings by staff, uh, and then they review those findings 
And remember, quasi-judicial means that you're acting with proper due process safeguards in place. Everybody gets a chance to be heard. Uh, that's why there's a 20-day um, notice requirement before the public hearing takes place. The uh, Planning Commission did that in this case. They sent you, they uh, disagreed with three of the, I think, 10 or 12 staff findings and, and sent you a recommendation of denial for the application. Anytime you get a recommendation, regardless of whether it's for acceptance or denial, you have three options as the governing body. The statute and your zoning ordinance give you three options. You can adopt the recommendation of the Planning Commission. In this case, that would be to deny the applicant's request. You can override the Planning Commission's recommendation, and that always takes a two-third vote to do that. Since there are five of you, that means it effectively takes four of you to do that. You can also return it to the Planning Commission with a statement specifying your reasons for refusing to uh, adopt or deny their recommendation. In other words, you're saying, take another look at this and look at these factors. We don't think this review was, was thorough enough on these points. In this case, you received a protest petition within the 14 days signed by the owners of more than 20% of the property within the notification radius by state statute and uh, by your local zoning ordinance. Uh, that means that any adoption of an ordinance except to uh, to move the project forward, in other words, to grant the applicant an affirmative relief and allow them to continue. In this case, that would be giving them a conditional use permit. Must be passed by at least a three quarters vote. So it really didn't change anything, because in this case, you'd be overriding the Planning Commission, which would take two thirds. The protest means you have to get three quarters. And since there's only five of you, the math works out the same, because we can only cut Zach into so many pieces. Um, and so it affected uh, it, it, the outcome is the same. It takes four votes for you all to to adopt or excuse me to approve uh, the project. So um, you do not have to have a public hearing. There's only one public hearing required that has been done at this point. I think this is the second meeting where you've talked about this issue. Uh, those who have a stake in it, for or against, have come before you. Uh, at this point, your options are these: you can put one of these two ordinances forward to your next regular meeting, and you have a version of both, one to adopt the recommendations of the Planning Commission, that is to deny the project, and the other is to override the Planning Commission and approve the project. That one will take four votes out of five when you have your regular meeting. The other option that you would have before you is to do nothing. Doing nothing is uh, ultimately treated as a denial. Uh, of the application it would not go forward. So if you would be unable to reach consensus on what to do, if you would be unable to say the motion was to uh, approve the project and you were only able to get three of five votes on that, that would be treated as a denial uh, of the applicant's proposal. So those are the options that you have at this point. Um, I would recommend to you, as I do on all of these things, once you've heard all of the uh, input from members of the community and from the applicant, um, it helps everyone to either uh, win or lose, uh, approved or denied, to move forward if they have an idea of where it is that you all are at uh, and what you're going to do. So um, that's the next steps for you. I can go over those again or clarify, or if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Well, I've got a question. So uh, if it went back to the planning commission, we sent it back to them, would they have to have a supermajority at this point to approve if they did? They would not. Would they would they would two or three they would simply look at everything again and then send you back a response to the concerns that you raised okay and so then, it would come back to us if they yes approved it then and then they, we still approve. they said we looked at it and here's where we're at we still recommend denial or after reviewing it we recommend approval okay, so, so they would still take super majority at this level right gotcha. not Initiating any kind of conflict, the commission, let me phrase that, does not initiate initiating any kind of conflict in this matter if we were to have some conversations with any of these folks, are we? I always recommend that you treat your role in this as quasi-judicial as well. And so that communications that take place about this take place in a public forum, uh, in an open meeting. And you can imagine how you would feel in a courtroom if the judge had interviewed witnesses without you being allowed as a party to know what that interview went like. Um, and so I would recommend if you want additional input from people that you would have staff 
send a letter and say, we're going to hear this issue or we'll talk about this issue on this date. You know, if you have an interest, please come in. I suspect that the fact that it's been noticed up and you've you've heard from folks both at the public hearing at the Planning Commission level and here today, Mr. Mayor, is indicative of who has the biggest interest in the issue. Um, but I, it, this as opposed to different, any other case where I would recommend, yes, you know, go get as much input as you can. Uh, I would not recommend that you conduct your own investigation uh, into the feelings of the members who are not here. I, I, the reason I ask is I don't want the neighbors to not see us around there, you know, maybe doing some investigation and not think that we don't care yeah. because I, we certainly do. And I think that the, the time that you've spent on it um, for a governing body, again, you don't have to goes into that. And the other thing I would tell you, I think, to help uh, alleviate that concern a little bit is that um, the Planning Commission is required by law to send um, written notice of that public hearing to every neighbor um, so that they know that it's on the agenda and they have the opportunity to come and be heard there. Uh, and you've also made it clear in your uh, agendas that you put out both online and, and to those who want notice that you were taking it up twice. So. I think you've done a very thorough job, and I would commend this commission in particular on zoning issues that you do a pretty good job of, of making sure everybody who wants to be heard is heard. Commissioner C, any other questions for Mr. Finch? Are there, Thank you. So, and, and I don't actually know if this is a question for you or for some for Mr. Hall, but are there particular factors that which particular factors did the planning commission disagree with two six and seven okay thank you <clears throat> any other questions thank you okay, <clears throat> okay commissioners uh we've, we've heard from the public comments uh at our had some information from our legal counsel had a couple of discussions about this and i'm sure some of us have done our own due diligence how would uh the commission like to proceed with item three could we is can we talk to cal as the representative i guess for the bze yeah. more than just the minutes kind of yeah cal you know, do you mind we'll put you on the spot what I'm here for today. But. <laughs> <laughs> we'll skip the other question. Then. Okay. Picking on you for that. Okay. So just kind of, obviously, as you were in the meeting, reading through the minutes of kind of what everyone, <clears throat> what other members who voted know, what their thoughts were about the, that there's uh, duplexes are in proximity to rental properties. I saw Maine said there's a landlord uh, who does not want more rental properties in that area. Um, was his did he have anything really other than the, the look of historic neighborhoods um whether his remarks kane said a duplex is out of character but anything built today is out of character um so i'm assuming that's why he would say no crowley said that single family home without a garage would put more parking on the street um nothing would be done there and then you mentioned a historic overlay um pushback from residents and then parking was that pretty much the general I think that's pretty much what the general discussion was. I, I don't recall anything other than other than that. It was a, it was a lengthy discussion, and I think we were in the same. And again, I don't want to speak for the other commissioners, obviously. I just, uh, but I think we were in the same point where you were. There's, we need housing. Is this the place for it? And so there was a lot of discussion, and there was actually a reluctance, I think, to even move forward on it. I, I think if you watch the video, it took <laughs> us quite a bit of time to put any motion forward. So uh, again, I do not want to speak for the other commissioners, uh, but at the end of the day, we felt that 267 were, we didn't agree with the, with the uh, planner and staff, and so we recommended denial. And that's, uh, I don't know that that would change, but you know, if you decide you want to kick it back to us, we'll look at it again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions for Cal? Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Okay, Commissioners, how would you like to move on item three? 
climate movement to our said July 6th. Is that our next meeting? That is our next commission meeting, yes. We don't have a meeting the fourth, which would be a study session anyway, but our next meeting will be the 6th of July. Clayton. Do we on that need to decide what for the three options we have we are moving forward with? It's, I'm assuming you're going to want to, or we're going to want to state kind of what we want to move forward, correct? It would probably be best that you decide whether you're moving the approval or denial ordinance forward. We can put both of them on the agenda, uh, take up one of them at, at that time. Um, but it, it, it typically the custom is to move forward one of the ordinances that you want about. Or the recommendation back to the commission for third option, right? Right. Okay. So, Mayor Pro Tem Skidmore, which which would you like to move forward? Well, I I felt like uh, to approve, but perhaps there is some merit to send it back to the planning commission. I'd like to have that discussion with the others. Commissioner Clayton, might as well. Yeah, would we'll be open to that. Um, it's obviously tough. There's a lot of emotion around it um, and trying to not let emotion determine governance um, is tough, um, especially in our country currently. There's a lot going on with emotion and governance. Um, and so that's hard for me specifically because um, I would disagree um, kind of as they stated that anything built today, no one's building bungalows, no one's building Victorians, no one's building homes that would fit these historic neighborhoods. Um, and I think it's unrealistic for us to expect anyone to ever do that, especially with the rising costs. So I would say I disagree with the number two and six from the Planning Commission. So I would recommend the option to send back to them as well. Okay. So are you okay with moving both the approval and the sending back? Is that what you're saying or just yes. okay okay commissioner kaylee let's have the discussion good commissioner greg um i mean i'll i'll just say i guess initially my i'm in favor of um granting the conditional use permit just because i i agree with staff's findings and and um disagree with a few of the commission findings. So um, I would be in favor of whether we decide to send it back. I just, part of me feels like that's also kicking it back because we don't want to make a hard decision. But um, if, it, if that's what everybody wants to do, I'm fine with that as well. Well, I'm certainly in favor of making a decision July 6th. So I'm in favor of moving both of those options forward. Um, and let, let's have that discussion and give give both of these, uh, the applicant and the neighbors, a decision on July 6th. So I think that's what we'll do. Thank you. Okay. That will move us on to item four which is our continued discussion of consulting services and agreement with the moderate income housing grant application and administration. Mr. Hall or Mr. Neinstead. So um, this is, you discussed it at the last meeting. Um, the reason that uh, staff is recommending that we enter into this agreement and have this relationship with the Southeast Kansas Regional Planning Commission is because they have expertise in uh, applying for grants. And uh, there's a lot at stake with this grant opportunity. Uh, an RFP is going to be released July 8th, and then there is an application deadline in September. And uh, it's important that uh, an application is approved you know, and the city gets a grant. There will be a couple other rounds, other opportunities, but um, it's, you know, we'll learn a lot. If, if the city does not receive a grant award with that first opportunity, something will be learned and we can go forward. Uh, the consulting agreement, uh, there's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's $5,000, the, the fees are $5,000 for pre-award services and then $15,000 for post-award services. So if, if uh, 
if the city does receive a grant, then we'll have this ongoing relationship with the consultant and they will administer the grant proceeds. If not, and we want to go forward, uh, that will require another agreement. Yeah. Um, and do uh, you have any questions about the program or, or so, the contract? Yeah, just real quick, uh, 20,000 total if a, grant or if a grant is approved. Correct. Okay, just making sure. I didn't want it was, didn't know if it was five and then that might have been deducted if the 15 was paid right later, but it's 20,000 total if, if approved. And the other reason that we turn to Mrs. Gale Moore is we have a history with Mrs. Gale Moore um, uh, working on our grant request. Um, she also helped Paul with the county's grant request in the last couple of years. We've kind of jointly used her. So she is familiar with all of us up here and has proven to be an able administrator and an able writer. Do we have a grant writer for the query fire or something similar like this, or do you recall that, that requiring? Kind of well, you know, I, I do not remember. That was, but while that was an MIH, it was more straightforward than what yeah, this, this is. is. So, yeah, it was a very successful. But project. I will check. That's okay. Are we solely involved with this grant writer, or are there other entities that are involved? Meaning other cities, uh, counties? I do, well, I would imagine she is working for other counties that, and other cities, but I did not ask her that specific question. I, I don't know if she's, maybe Paul does, I don't know if she's reached out, or if any other cities in the county have reached out to her. I'm not aware of it. I'm in favor of this agreement. I think we should move it on. I think it's a great idea, too. Okay, we'll move it on to our July 6th meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hall. That'll move us on to our review of our May reports. Uh, Commissioner Graves. I think we have. Did you have another? Oh. I think we want to let Director Hall go one more time. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm so excited about our May reports that I was jumping to get to those. That's how fun they were to read. <laughs> let me. Okay. Item uh, Item Five: Continue discussion of ordinance vacated setback lines and a pedestrian easements at the, uh, the final plat of the codes at Tallgrass. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have some slides here. Don't intend to go through every slide. But a couple, couple we can highlight. I get that to work. Hold on, boy. Just tell me. Okay, there we go. So you're gonna, you're gonna advance the slides? Okay. Okay, thank you. So this is the location, Coza Tall Grass uh, Subdivision Plat. Plat was approved uh, around 2005, I believe, 2006. Uh, a lot of it didn't get built out. You kind of know the history of it. Um, and so um, go ahead and go to the slide number. This slide number four, please. Okay, so this exhibit describes what is being requested. Um, where you see a solid red line, those lots, it's proposed that the setback lines be vacated. And those are the setback lines. That's where they're located. As you can see, they kind of meander. Some are really deep on the lots. And then, as you can see, that kind of arced blue line, that's the pedestrian easement that is proposed to be vacated. There's a pedestrian easement right there, and that it's not proposed that that be vacated. What you also see on here are 
Those lots that are highlighted in green or outlined in green, that's where a house has already been built. The aerial photo might not reflect that because the aerial photo is not that recent. And then the lots outlined in yellow, a permit's been issued and homes are under construction. One thing I'll point out is uh, this lot up here, these two lots up here, um, we processed a replat by Mr. Vandeventer for the purpose of moving a setback line to make it less restrictive. That certainly was an option, but a very expensive and complicated, overly complicated option for the applicant because of all these different lots and they're not contiguous. So it would have taken four replat applications. So our subdivision code gives you the opportunity to vacate setback lines and easements by this process. I'm missing a slide here too. Paul, would you be able to go to slide five, please? <clears throat> there are slides missing, I don't know why. Anyhow, um, one thing that I showed at the last meeting is how restrictive some of these setback lines were. Uh, they left a very small building envelope. The lots in some cases are kind of wedge shaped. That makes it even more restrictive. Just very difficult to build on these lots. The lots are narrow. Um, one thing you'll find in your packet is is a uh, aerial photo of the pedestrian easement at the north end of the of the subdivision. What page is that? That is. I have it from the previous packet, so. Might be on page 48. So you can see the photos. They show the location of the pedestrian easement. One thing that's important to point out is there could be some concern about, okay, you take about way that pedestrian easement, you remove the sidewalk, and now you have a gap in the sidewalk. The city owns a couple of the lots and the tract the drainage track, stormwater drainage track that fronts on that pedestrian easement. And the city's agreed to be part of this application. The applicant has agreed to make sure that that sidewalk is restored, but in the street right of way where sidewalks typically are located prior to getting a CO, certificate of occupancy for the homes. So there's no gap in the sidewalk. There we go. Yeah, that's the photo. So this is the diagram that shows the, that's the pedestrian easement. What's gonna happen, and it, there's a condition that is recommended that would be included in the ordinance that you adopt. Uh, that requires that this will be removed after, after the applicant gets a building permit, building permits, and then this will be added back in in the right of way before the builder gets a certificate of occupancy. So the, the first condition that's recommended, it requires that where there is going to be a sidewalk in the pedestrian easement that's gonna remain, that there be a 20 foot setback or a 20 foot minimum length of a driveway so cars are not blocking the sidewalk. That's not currently in our code. It's not currently a requirement. So that's something that they're offering to do to provide for a better environment, provide for uh, pedestrian access, walkability, and so forth. The second condition. The second condition uh, concerns the, the, the restoration of the sidewalk, as I just described. 
So it's recommended as <clears throat> approval of the vacation, vacations, I should say, with these conditions. These conditions reflect exactly what the applicant proposed and what we worked out in the details. And those would be included in the ordinance that's adopted. One thing I'll point out is uh, the stakeholder outreach on this on this uh, application was extensive. Uh, it included all owners in the subdivision and all adjacent owners within 200 feet, not including crossing the street to the west. In addition, uh, at staff's recommendation, the owner applicant agreed to hold an open house. They held that open house. They contacted the same people. They held the open house at a nice office down on Main Street. There's no opposition to this. I've never heard one person contact the city saying they're opposed or concerned about this. I had a conversation with the builder. He asked me about it. I told him, he said he was not concerned. So in spite of all the folks that are contacted, involved and engaged, there is no, there has been no concerns expressed about what's being proposed here. <clears throat> And the planning commission reviewed this. They made a recommendation of approval, um, and their fi the findings for that are all in the in the report in your packet. Is that all? Answer any questions you have, or the applicant is here. If uh, you want to hear from the applicant, Director Hall, this only affects the applicant's lots, correct? It does not affect any. Uh lots that are vacant right now that aren't being built on that aren't that are unpermitted it affects the applicant's lots it affects two lots that the city owns and track b that the city owns but no other lots that were sold to other individuals that might possibly be building down the road that is correct okay <clears throat> sorry excuse me so Mike, does this, uh, do we have this situation on any other plats in town? I'd say most of the plats have setback lines on them. Most of them, most of the plats that are relatively recent because it's, it's uh, in our subdivision ordinance that plats include setback lines. Um, I haven't heard complaints or concerns about other lots. I did get a question about a lot in I did get a question about a lot in uh, I always have a hard time with the name of this it's the it's the common lot that was converted into four lots um, Westwood West, Westwood Circle yeah. Westwood yeah. Circle yeah. that's it okay so uh, the applicant asked me about uh, granting an administrative variance to the setback line and uh, I I don't have authority to do that because it's a setback line on a plat. The Board of Zoning Appeals doesn't have authority to do that because it's a setback line on a plat. So That's normally what we have on plats are our existing setback lines, all right? They're existing setback lines that reflect what's in the zoning code. Um, that's how we do it. That's not unusual that cities do that. I think it's almost a service to the buyer because the information's on a plat map. The problem is, is it's hard to deal with that setback line. It has to go to the governing body of each city to vacate that setback line, or there's a replat that has to be filed to vacate that setback line. So, so you may not be, and you may want to think about this, so, but how in the future, if somebody comes in with something out of the ordinary on a plat, which is their money and their time, how in the future, should we handle this if someone comes in later and wants that change? I think if someone wants to change the setback lines, it's better if it's replatted because there's a plat map that will be recorded with the register of deeds and the information is very clear if it's replatted. But that costs a lot of money. It's a big burden on an applicant wanting to do that because they have to go out and hire a design professional to produce a plat map. Um, I think it's better, in my opinion, it's better to not have setback lines on plats because it's, 
it's uh, very unwieldy. Um, it requires this situation. And it would be better if every owner in there was part of this application, but that's an impossible thing to ask this owner to do, to corral every owner and have them part of this application. So I think, it, in my opinion, it's better not have setback lines on plats. There could be uh, there could be exceptions to that. I think in the future, uh, I believe that the city commission has the authority to not do that because you can waiver. You can have there are exceptions to the subdivision ordinance that are within your authority. I'm not sure if that one is. That's probably a question for our city attorney, but um, that's that's my opinion. If someone wants to do something unusual that doesn't quite fit in our zoning, that's probably a textbook plan unit development, and that's a zoning, that's a type of zoning. One more question. Yeah, sure. After, if the commission moves ahead, proves this change, how do you communicate that to the register of deeds? Where the plant is filed. The ordinance gets recorded, right. I believe. I don't know if it states that on the ordinance. Maybe it should, but, but the ordinance gets recorded. So it'll it'll be in the chain of title. It's just Thank not you. as obvious as a map, maybe. Thank you. I like your suggestion about uh, not requiring the setbacks. Um, I think this, uh, this process is probably um, set the applicant back and you know it's that's the steps that he has to go through but certainly set the the builder back um and you know an extended period of time that might not have been necessary if we'd have had you know a situation like what you're talking about not not requiring setbacks and just at that point our our uh, ordinances would set would, would set those setbacks then correct yeah it, it reverts to what the zoning right. regulations require okay. and zoning regulations change over time maybe there's a preference in the future for smaller setbacks, but the setback, the setbacks on a plat can be an obstacle to that. I think it's important to remember. I think the commission always ought to keep an open mind on different ways of doing things while looking ahead to the future of something that might happen. You don't know what's going to happen, but I, I think it's it's worthwhile to have the discussion about this because things changed from the time this was originally filed about how we how we look at things, how we view those things. But um, I, I, I think you're having the right discussion. I think you just have to remember that if somebody comes to you with something out of the ordinary on a plat that is different from what you have in setbacks. And doing a couple lots different is different than doing one for you. Well, if anybody's seen the, the, the builder throw up two houses fairly quickly, and if we wouldn't have had this, uh, um, this issue come up, uh, probably would have had more built at this point. And that's why the lots, you know, they've sat empty for, for an extended period of time. And uh, if we wouldn't have this issue come up, there probably would be more built, and that's why we sold them to have them built. So anything that can help streamline with little to no opposition, as you're stating, I'm full of that. If I could add something sure. Mr. Mayor. So the plat was a concept that was brought to us by the developer. The developer had this real certain concept of what a neighborhood, this kind of interesting neighborhood idea. I'm not sure I understand it, but um it's not something that the city required them to do i don't think i don't think the city would have said you have to have these setback lines on the plot they did that because they wanted a certain type of neighborhood <clears throat> and someone would buy into that neighborhood and they would see these parameters or standards built by and that's they would know it up front commissioners do you have any other questions for director hall how would you like to move on item five? Is it okay to put it on the agenda for July 6th? Yes. Like Thank Director you. Hall can probably make that slide presentation in his sleep. Too. <laughs> yeah. Say. As long as I can find him. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Director Hall.
Okay, that moves on to, I believe, at this point, review of May reports. Commissioner Graves. Um, I just had a few comments and a couple of little questions. Um, so on HR's um, page, which is packet page 113, I just wanted to comment and say that I think it's great that we um, are pretty proactive about things. And um, like, for example, it says, um, KMU Director of Training and Safety conducted uh, training sessions in person on heat stress. And I think it's really good that we make those a priority and try to prevent some of the things that can happen, especially in the hot weather. Um, packet page 129, I just had a question on, it said open legacy square restrooms in May. Um, and I had had someone ask about the availability of those restrooms, so I wasn't sure if if they're closed most of the time or if they're if they're open for the summer officially now i believe we do have them open okay <clears throat> as well as the showers okay well yeah yes we do okay <clears throat> so then i just had more <clears throat> more do we have vanessa here with gray falls yes Yes. Um, Vanessa, I was just wondering, I know this is not in the monthly report, but I had seen there was a Facebook post about th that you guys were basically at a critical capacity level for uh, animals. And I was wondering if we have improved any or if we're still really full. Yes. Thanks for asking that, Commissioner Graves. Uh, this is Vanessa from Prairie Paws Animal Shelter. It has been a kind of a national crisis. So we're not unique. It's definitely not our community. Our community is a community of animal lovers. That remains to be true. Uh, but there has been a significant increase in animals entering animal shelter facilities across our country and then a huge decrease in adoptions coming out. And that has caused a new formula to be used to assess animal shelters. And it's basically a percentage of outcomes over intakes. And if that number is 100, it means that there is an equilibrium. So as animals are entering, they're leaving at the same rate. If that animal, if that number is below 100, then we're accumulating capacity over time. And if that number stays below 100 for a long time, it, you have to reverse equilibrium for such a long time to get back on track. And so that's where we're at. Our number is 74, uh, which is way below 100. And it has been that way for months. So it's not that we had one bad month, <laughs> it's that we've had a couple of months combining, but we did do fee waived adoptions and the community has come out like they always do and they responded to that post in the right way and they helped us out. So we will still never euthanize for space, but it was tricky. It was really tricky for a while there, but we're out of it for now. We appreciate it. I think that's all I have. All right. Commissioner Taylor. Um, I have, I, I appreciate, I don't want to steal uh, Commissioner Skidmore's, or Pro Tem Skidmore's thunder, but I always appreciate the um, sales tax income comparison um, on page 96. Um, I do think it's interesting about with about the growth that we've seen, and I and I wonder if that growth may not be contributed to internet sales tax that is now being contributed or is now being collected. But I mean, it's certainly nice to see that um, we've seen some steady growth in sales to, um, sales tax income. I don't know. Do you have any words of wisdom you want? You have to come up. Do you have any words of wisdom you want to say about that? Not necessarily. Or other than early in the year, we had seen some what I would consider a little more significant than we normally see, mm -hmm. and we were a little optimistically cautious because we weren't sure if that was going to trend downward. But it's really fairly stable, uh, somewhere around nine to ten percent overall right now, which is incredible considering typically we would expect somewhere around three and a half percent. At least a lot of cities use that as a benchmark. Um, to to try and find that that right balance of being conservative enough, but optimistic enough to be able to project your finances. So we're, we are sitting in a pretty good position there for sales tax overall. Excellent. Thank you. Um, my uh, 
Next and last question is on page 108 and is for Chief Matthias. Um, Chief Matthias, and this is just a uh, just so that I can understand and the public can understand. Tell me what is an overlapping call and what would you consider an overlapping call? Give me an example of how that would work. I see about 10% of our calls are considered overlapping. So overlapping is when we have two calls simultaneously. Uh, two trucks are out, and that could be a fire truck or a utility. Uh, but they're on some type of call so uh, and actually that's down it's typically running about 17 to 18 percent monthly uh, but that means we're we have two trucks or two calls going on the same time. okay so one out of it's, ten times you've got here in two different places at one time is what you're saying for the yeah, last month for this month that. for this month yeah. okay thank you and let me see that about 20 percent of the time normally yeah okay thank you that's that's it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Clayton. Well, Commissioner Kaler stole my thunder on the online sales tax because that was exciting. <laughs> I like that. I like seeing those numbers go up because obviously people are spending money in the community. Um, so I like that as well. I did it for devices that well. I have one question on a, uh, a good intent call. As I saw, that was a quarter of those. What's a good intent call? So a good intent call is. Uh, for instance, uh, somebody calls and possibly they smell an odor in their house. Uh, we go up there and they're not, uh, most of the time it's a stuff. <laughs> and so that's a good intent. Or, you know, we, we go check on different things. Smoking the air is, is just a good intent. Mm, okay. That was all I had. Thank you. Mayor Perkins, get more. Nothing about a skunk is good. <laughs> okay. Well, on page, uh, they, you do know they get perfume for the skunk. Well, yeah. Well, you know, you know how to keep a skunk from smelling, don't you? You hold know, his nose. Okay. Don't get that. Oops, get a bad joke. Thank you. Okay. Uh, they might not have heard that. In the yeah. Well, on, yeah. on, on this page with all our investments, page 94, and I think I brought up at our, our uh, audit that we're drowning in liquidity, and although that there's a pun in there somewhere, I think it's true, and I think we're kind of working on that. As rates go higher, we're going to be looking at possibly putting some of this, more of our money uh, in investments right now, 15% of it, 85% is liquid, and so we're, we're going to be working with that. I know uh, Melanie and Rebecca is working on that good. Our current... Uh, my concern was that if we put too much in investments and we had to cash in one of our MIP uh, investments, is there a penalty that a cost like a CD? Do we know? Yeah, I was exactly. You want me to talk? Sure. Please. I know a CD typically you'll lose six months of interest as penalty, three or six months, depending on the bank. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, I did actually just, reply to your email today, okay. but I'm gonna pull it up so that sure. I'm not sure. just um, ad limiting. I don't like to do that. But it's very similar to CDs. Uh, I looked it up for their um, the KMIP. But there is, is is there's an if you did an early withdrawal on fixed rate deposits. So we have both fixed rates, and then we have money just in the overnight, and so. Um, the best way I can describe the overnight is think of it as like a checking account, essentially, that pays, um, right now it's paying 1% interest, so a nice return for a checking account. And you can put money in the overnight at any time and take it out with no penalty. It just takes a little bit longer to move it, to wire it from bank to bank, so there'd be a small delay in the money. And that's a 1% fee or, or rate right now? Yeah, 1% on right? the overnight. Okay, good. All right. Um, but if you have like a fixed rate deposit, so like right now we have um, 180 day fixed and we have two 90 day fixed accounts. So if we were to take any money out of those, that's where the penalties would come from. And it would be a penalty of at least equal to a minimum of 15 days of interest and a maximum penalty of 90 days interest. And then the penalty can be taken out of the principal amount if you haven't accrued enough to pay for it. So that would be the only um, penalty that we would Okay. Incur. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks. And uh, where's our current uh, you know, one year rate for the MIP? Do you know that? Yeah, I looked them up today. Yeah. Thought you might ask. Yeah. So, um, you know, are you prepared? Bless your heart. Yeah. 
So their rates right now, if you did a one year with KMIP, it's 2.84%. Yeah. Okay. I, I also thought that was good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I guess all the sales taxes too, just added comment to what's already been said, but yeah, every month uh, so far this year is beaten last year's uh, rates and even the year before that. So I'm just seeing this progress uh, getting better and better. I'm just, in, uh, it's always encouraging as I drive through Walmart parking lot, see a lot of out of county plates. Uh, it seems like a lot of people do come here. We draw a huge, huge crowd, what I'm saying, from the, uh, the trade territory. So it's always good to see that, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's being brought in by out of towners, if not just solely on the backs of the people of Ottawa. So it's always good to see that. Um, then just comment, just a brief statement on Prairie Falls and the auditorium. We don't go to those pages, but I'm just always impressed uh, with you guys being able to continue to show some profit on that. So we don't see red numbers like we did many years ago. And I'm just glad for that, that we're doing good on both of those uh, auditorium and Prairie Falls. Uh, so good work, ladies, keep that going. And on the airport, just a comment that we will be bringing before the city commission sometime uh, a rate increase for the, uh, the rent for the key hangers. We've been at the same rate for several years, and so we're going to be looking at a rate increase uh, if it's overdue and to meet with the competition. I think it's, uh, it's well planned, the timing for it. And I think that is all I had. Thank you, Pro uh, Mayor Broker and Skidmore. You actually just answered one of my questions. So, um, do we have anybody from the airport available? Uh, Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is Jim Reader. Good afternoon, everyone. Jimmy, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Hey, I was reviewing pa uh, packet page 131 in your monthly report, which is just a bar graph. Um, my question is, and if you have any input on possibly why, uh, aviation sales and jet fuel sales are, I, I guess I, I could say significantly less from 2021 to 2022. Do you uh, think, you, you know of anything that might be contributing to that? I believe it's because of all the rain up until recently. All the what? I believe. I believe it's because of all the rain and it caused crops to be behind. So the crop spraying uh, has not really kicked off as soon and they buy lots of fuel. Gotcha. Okay. And I'm sure that uh, cost of fuel is probably contributing to some of that too. It, possibly. Uh, I really think more than anything is the crop dusters. All right. Sorry to keep you on the line so long, but that's the only question I had for you. Jimmy, thank you. I'm glad to help. Thank you. Paul, do you have anything that you want to say about FCDC? We'll talk about the, we have a, we have a meeting coming up in a couple weeks. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about that. Working with uh, Richard and Laura and uh, uh, Mr. Finch, we're going to do a we've sent out an invitation. Thanks to Laura uh, today to developers and contractors. We'll bring in a gentleman from Kansas Housing Authority, and he'll come and share the details on the new uh, tax incentives that uh, the state legislature passed just this past session. And so there'll be an opportunity for them uh, to come and hear what those incentives are, uh, meet city staff, and uh, you know build those relationships, and hopefully encourage them to take advantage of those opportunities and start doing some more development uh, here in the city and in the county. Uh, is, real focus in the city, however. Is that meeting open to anybody? It's invitation only, but if somebody has not received an email invitation and is interested in coming, they can call me or email me and we'll get them on the list. Thank you. I might also tell you that uh, Paul commissioned a study with Wichita State to update our labor shed. The good thing about this study is it's 15 pages and it gets right to the point. And 
uh, I think, uh, well, I know we're working with Paul and with the county and the school district, try and get a joint meeting where Paul could actually present that to all three bodies because all three bodies have an interest right. in where we get our labor and uh, how we get them. So thank you for doing yeah, that. No, thank you. Anything else? Uh, you know, you always get asked about proximity park and I sorry to report in the time I've been doing this, we're almost through July. This is the first month without a single lead. Um, well, that's disappointing. It's not surprising based on the economy and what we're looking at as far as the uncertainty. We look at that in our own pocketbooks and budgets and industry is no different. Uh, we are still seeing some industry do expansions, much like Calmar. Uh, there's some expansions taking place up north of us. Um, but uh, as far as new new investment and new industry and new business uh, expansions, those are not uh, vibrantly coming across my desk at the present time. So I share that. Like I said, it's not great news, but I know that's something that's of interest to everybody in the public. So I just want to share that. Well, I certainly appreciate your ability to pivot. You know, uh, we certainly want to focus on proximity park, um, but if something, as you say, is if, is not moving forward, uh, the ability to pivot and focus on you know housing or something like that, uh, so that all facets of our of our you know uh, community are growing. And I'm spending some time, and you'll hear more about it on on the e community and and size up, which is for smaller business and retail and commercial and. Uh, John Cohen and I just had a set through an example of that this afternoon on the size up. So it's a pretty neat tool. And um, so, yeah, we're we're pivoting to different places in different ways because it's to get the industry. Everything else also needs to be healthy. So we're we're working together on a lot of different angles. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where we are today. Appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll give. Any other director, uh, if they have any comments about anything they'd like for us to know that we haven't discussed that they think is a, a necessity, <laughs> if you'd like to say something, I'll give you the floor right now. Nobody ever takes that opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's all right. We'll call on you next time. <laughs> Chief, I'm going to call. I got a question for you. I left you for last because I knew you were coming up next know. on the item Thanks anyway. So. <laughs> Still on monthly reports for me, I just got a, a question about how many times roughly, whether it's weekly, monthly, yearly, that you might use your drone. Oh, that's and a good what question. reasonings behind it. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Um, I ha I could pull the direct numbers, but I'm guessing probably two to three times a month. Uh, I'd say yeah, uh, anywhere from uh, lost people to. Uh, People that are evading the law, uh, car wrecks, uh, fires. Uh, we put them up for hazmat, for instance. Uh, the nurse tanks over at Forest Park, the ammonium night, uh, the ammonium uh, trailers. You can tell the, the level or where the gas is coming off of one. So uh, on, the, on the infrared site. Today, the uh, Oakland Park's down doing that water training. Uh, with our folks and uh, it has a infrared ability so we're looking at some infrared uh, shoulder lights that put on our put on our swimmers in case they get in the water or, mm -hmm. and so you know i'm not a tech guy and it's due to my age i'm sure but uh, i am totally surprised how often we use them and uh, in the budget this 23 budget we have uh, a, a larger drone, and I think it's much, much needed. It, they're expensive, there's no doubt about it, but uh, the, our current drones, I think along with PDs, there are limits, you know, high wind, rain, they can't do, do any, any flights in rain, uh, but that newer one, or that the larger one can, and there's those are some times that we really need to get something up in the air. As a command officer, uh, <clears throat> It just your situational awareness of the scene is just dramatically increased. Yeah, you, know, you could see your 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 people in a boat half a mile away, uh, and so it's just calming for a command officer to know that you know your people are safe. They're doing the right thing. If they need help, send it. So, 
Thank you. Appreciate that. That's it. Okay. Then you know, stick around because you're going to give us an, uh, right. an update on our ordinance prohibiting fireworks. Okay. This is a booming topic. It wow. really is. <laughs> Did you give them Thank a Thank you. No, no. Nice. Yeah, I know. Stay. I'm a better fire Stay chief calm. than a comedian. So. But. Uh, it's tough. <laughs> Uh, comedian is supposed to never laugh at his own jokes. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is this has gained some uh, some interest on social media, and, and so since I've been here since 1990, we've had this uh, municipal code chapter nine uh, outlawing fireworks within the city limits of Ottawa, the, either to purchase them or to light them, use them within the city of Ottawa city limits. As you well know, uh, all the firework tents that are set up are directly outside the city limits. Um, that's for a reason, because uh, you cannot sell them in, within the city limits. This uh, municipal code has been on the books since 1982. It was revisited back in 2015. Uh, with no major changes that I can I can see. Um, so if you are a person that is caught violating the provisions of this article, shall be deemed guilty of a class C misdemeanor. What that means, and Chief Weingarten can absolutely talk talk about that. Uh, we cannot go out and catch every person that's shooting fireworks. Does this? Does this prohibit people on paper? Yes. In person, no. We all know that, you know, today it starts uh, June 27th, it opens and it closes uh, July 5th. And a nuance on that is that includes mail order fireworks. Didn't know you could get them through the mail, but you can. Wow. Uh, so there are a lot of complaints through the years, I've uh, been in conversation over the years with our city attorney on how how do we address this? Do we just do away with it? Do we truly try to enforce it, which is, is we just can't do that. We don't have enough people to go around and investigate every single fireworks call violation. And Chief Weingartner can, they're mostly his folks going out and doing that, uh, investigating the fireworks. Uh, and I know they don't have time to do that. I think it's something we probably should look at. Of course, we're not going to be able to do anything this year, but probably have to probably need to look at it and just say, you know, uh, is this the right thing to do? A lot of cities will have you can do certain type of fireworks. You can't do other types. For instance, a couple of years ago that I only know them by the Chinese lantern, but uh, City of Wichita and, and other cities, they allow fireworks, but they prohibit the, the Chinese lantern due to, and so does Johnson County, due to uh, going up in the air, coming back down on the shake, shake roof shingle home, uh, Western Kansas, wheat fields this time of year. You know, there's some really good wheat out there just right across city limits, and I'd hate to see something go up that because of fireworks have we had fireworks uh, incidents in the past yes i don't have the numbers uh there's been some very fairly serious injuries through the years uh, all hospitals within the state of kansas is encouraged to uh, file fireworks injuries during that week of the fireworks are, are uh, sold they go on the uh, State Fire Marshal's website and they download a form. They can tally how many injuries. Um, the last set of numbers is from 2020. Uh, there was 180 serious injuries caused by fireworks in Kansas. Uh, this is an increase from 2019. Uh, over half the injuries occurred from fireworks uh, on the 4th of July. Uh, and most of them were from burns. The age range was from 25 to 34, um, but they did see a significant increase uh, between the age of 45 and 54. 
the highest number of injuries are caused by mortars or artillery fireworks. And of course, the person igniting them is most likely to be injured. Uh, a few years ago, and this is a big, this is uh, in Leavenworth, they had a, an individual killed and uh, it was a, I don't know if it's a city display or it was a for the city by a private company, but the individual was killed by a mortar. Um, so, you know, uh, it, I, I think it stand, It will stand, this municipal code will stand this year. I think we probably ought to look at it because it happens. People, you know, uh, people shoot fireworks. We all know that. Uh, Commissioner Graves mentioned that, you know, she's afraid <laughs> of fireworks. And there's a lot of people that are. A lot of people that do not like fireworks, a lot of pets do not like it. Um, and it's a stressful time for certain individuals and pets. And uh, so, and most of the time you can't control the sound, you know, uh, it just is the way it is. And some people really like 4th of July, some people don't. Uh, but I think we probably ought to look at this again and come up with something that, you know, might work for everybody. Because we're not going to have a display this year, which I always encourage people to just watch that one. It's free yeah. and it's safe and, you know, distance, but now we're not having one. Are we concerned about more private displays yeah. taking place in town? And yeah, and, and I am. And, you know, you look at the weather and it's actually kind of cooled down a little bit, but we're still fairly dry. Uh, and so one good thing we have here in Ottawa, we don't have that many shake shingle roofs. Uh, that's a, there's a big issue with that up in the city, uh, but you know we'll definitely get a few calls on Fourth of July and in that air, in this time frame from now until the fifth due to fireworks. So, any other questions? I don't believe so, Chief. Thank you. That's it. You don't have. No. All right. What about snakes? We got to go out of town to do those. The, the, the little snakes. <laughs> I was reading about that. Oh, you got oh there you go. Oh, look, he comes from here. So, with the municipal code, uh, nothing in this article shall be construed as applying to toy paper caps and cap guns and to the manufacturer, storage, sale, and the use of safety or sig signal flares, nor is prohibiting the sale and use of blank cartridges. For ceremonial, theatrical, and or athletic events. Uh, nor is prohibiting the fire firing of skyrockets or missiles when produced by a science instructor. Um, and when the place of the firing of the skyrocket or missile has to be approved by the fire chief or the designee. So it doesn't really say the snakes, but uh, that's been brought up a lot. <laughs> and I have my own opinion, but that's my opinion. So, so I'm glad you have the authority yeah, to give people the ability to shoot off some fireworks. But if somebody wants to, let, you know, shoot off a missile, could you kind of let us know yeah. about that, please? Yeah, yeah, appreciate that. And one other thing, it is illegal to shoot off from a public roadway, either if that's in the city or the county or state or federal highway. It is illegal to shoot off of a roadway. Thank you. Appreciate your All right, the you. information. Well, um, stay safe, okay? Yeah. Happy for you as well. You too. Adam moves on to comments by our city manager. Uh, I don't have it. Comments by our city commissioner, Commissioner Graves. I feel like I should maybe offer my services and people can bring their shaking dogs over and I can maybe sit them in the closet while I'm shaking. I don't have any comments. Thank you. Commissioner Taylor. Happy Independence Day to stop. Thank you. Commissioner Clayton. Um, I just want to say I saw the aquatic training stuff going on today. It looked like they had a lot of fun. Um, there's definitely some good work going on out there. Um, I didn't know, I wanted to at least say to Captain Weidengardner, um, obviously there was an issue um, in town over the weekend, which I'm sure everyone's aware of. Um, and I just thought that was handled well via social media, trying to get as much information out as we can. Um, obviously, there were some inappropriate things online, 
that I felt were inappropriate to me in a public platform, I should say. Um, so I thought they did a great job on that. Um, and so support to them, I guess, in this next month as they go into all of that. And then have a safe fourth as well. Thank you. Mayor Brent, Tim Skidmore. Moves on to comments by the uh, mayor. The only thing I have is commissioners in front of you, you have the handout for the Auto Fusion Business Expo. In the years past, we've had a table um, here. Uh, they have, we haven't had one in a few years just because I believe COVID shut them down for a little bit and then we haven't been back. Um, is anybody interested in um, attending? I just need to know so if we had enough that we could get a table. I'm, I'd go. I got one. I'd go as well. I got two. I'm, it's a I'm, it's a Tuesday. And it's August 9th. I'll do my best. Okay. Let me get a picture that night. Can you have a portable? Yeah, yeah portable AC. Oh, it's from the top. 109. Yes, yeah, <laughs> somewhere between that and 60. So we'll we'll get, get you. Yeah. Get you a table. Won't be there. All right. Sounds good. I especially I think with the possible internship that we had discussed in the budget for next year, probably an awesome opportunity to go to the college students. Well, I've been to one before. Um, it was a good time. We're not the uh, highlight of the night, I promise. Um, but it certainly gives us out there for uh, the community to have some conversations with us. The college have some conversations with us if they'd like. So I appreciate everybody uh, for attending. Um, I have no other comments, so I'll move us on to our announcements. We do not have a study session uh, July 4th, uh, and our regular meeting is at 7 p.m. on July 6th. Is there anything else coming before the commission tonight? I'll adjourn.